Well, I just need the puff suit. Yeah, of course. Tail end of a horrible cold. Feeling much more human, but it won't just go. Okay, thank you for inviting me. It's very nice to join you to talk about climate anxiety, climate distress. We're going to define it and go through some of the statistics and some of the different ways of understanding it. And as you can see from the title, I'm calling this Facing the Difficult Truths, plural, of the climate emergency. And we can engage with this as a apocalyptic disaster or a transformational moment in history. Now that's not putting a positive spin on it because there's nothing okay about what we're facing. But some of the ways in which we face this can give us opportunities for growth, psychological growth, sociological growth, political growth. But that is not putting a positive spin on it, I promise you. I want to introduce you. I'm here in my house, but not alone. Wilfred is currently asleep on the sofa next to me. So if you hear excited puppy noises or things in the background, that's Wilfred who's joining in. He's heard this talk multiple times though, so I think he probably doesn't have much to say right now. So very, very, very short overview. We're talking about cumulative impacts of climate change in the world today with record heat waves, wildfires, sea level rise, ice melting, flooding. And this is leading to physical and emotional distress. It's only in the last IPCC report that there has been an emphasis on the mental health impact of this. Understandably, up until now, we've been looking very much at the physical health impact primarily but now I think it's a good thing that we're starting to recognize the mental health impact because it's really important that we don't just dismiss this I would go so far as to say I think everybody on the planet is having some emotional response to this some climate anxiety and I want to be very clear it's an emotionally mentally healthy response to what's going on in the world it's only a sign that you care. If you didn't care, then we wouldn't feel levels of distress. And we're going to talk in a minute about the different levels of distress that people may be feeling. I also want to say that although we're talking about mental health and we're talking about distress, and I'm framing this as an emotionally, mentally healthy response, that's not to minimise the fact that that distress can be very difficult. And we were just talking before we started about you know, there is good support around for people. If at all, if you're at all worried, the most important thing to remember is it's a mentally healthy response and you're not alone with this. There are support services, counselling services and the Climate Psychology Alliance, which is an open access group and website, has a lot of resources that you can go to and help yourself to. There's also a list of counsellors available on the website who will give, I think it's up to three free support sessions or counselling sessions to anybody who's struggling with climate distress. So the one important thing is don't feel that you're on your own with this. There are multiple direct and indirect effects psychologically of climate change, which includes short term stress reactions, shock to extreme weather events, but also acute panic attacks following heat, for example, not so much in the UK at the moment, but we're certainly seeing that elsewhere around Europe. There's also longer term impacts on infrastructure, resource disruption, people unable to go to school, to college because of wildfires flooding. In fact, the flooding and the disruption from flooding here in the UK recently has had mass, massive impact and air pollution. So I'm trying to encourage us to take a psychoeducational approach to this. We have to strike a balance 
between acknowledging the difficulties of this and not minimizing those and stepping away from them, but equally not being overwhelmed by them because we might be halfway through the story of climate change. We're not at the beginning of the story, we're halfway. That doesn't mean there isn't a lot we can do. So I will be promoting a positive, optimistic, there is a lot we can do message at the same time as saying, and we need to recognize what we've done and how severe this is. So it's a both and approach. Psychologically, humans don't like feeling out of control, really. And the human ego tries to regain control of our psyche, our emotions, our cognitive thinking, our situation, our environment, other people. And we can do that by going to a naive, optimistic, it'll all be all right. We can, humans are, you know, innovative, carbon capture will save us type of approach and I'm exaggerating this to make the point or the other end of the spectrum doom and gloom apocalyptic thinking it's hopeless nihilism what's the point in trying to do something it's so big now paradoxically psychologically those are actually the same thing those are us trying to regain control of a situation where we can easily feel completely overwhelmed by the multiple complex systemic stresses that the planet is currently facing. The trick, how to navigate this psychologically, is to tolerate the desire to go to either end of that spectrum, but neither of those are going to save us and neither of those are true. It's not all doom and gloom, apocalypse, and it's not all going to be all right. It already isn't if you're living in India, the Philippines, the Maldives, Nigeria. That doesn't mean there isn't a lot we can do. But we have to tolerate that uncertainty and take action in the middle of those two positions emotionally. What we're seeing types of psychological distress in response to this, because it is a long term stressor, and I'm going to talk more about that as well in a minute. We've got climate anxiety, vicarious trauma. So seeing this, seeing the impact of climate change on the television, in news reports, through family and friends in India, other places in the world. That will distress us, as it should. Post-traumatic stress disorder, Timothy Morton, the philosopher, says we've also got pre-traumatic stress disorder, worrying about what's coming. And complicated grief. The reason it's complicated grief is because this is human caused. It is human caused disaster. It's not a natural disaster like a volcanic eruption. It's human caused. So it's complicated because, and generationally, there's big generational differences. Young people have not caused this in the way that older generations have. But we still need to feel the grief in order to process it, but not get stuck in the grief. I'll talk more about that as well in a moment. I promise you, I'm not going to just be here today joining you and just talking about all the bad news. Stick with me. But it is a debt psychology approach rather than a positivist psychology approach. Which fundamentally means, I think, being able to tolerate and navigate emotional responses of depression, despair, anger, frustration, anxiety, builds emotional resilience. This is part of navigating the world that we're in today. The last IPCC report, which I've just referenced, Antonio Guterres is famous for saying that delay is death. This was from February last year. And he frames it very clearly from the UN. He's very able to say this because he's not got those political restraints that individual governments have got. He says the facts are undeniable, abdication of leadership is criminal, the world's biggest polluters are guilty of us and of our only home. He is able to communicate about it in that way, which says this is not an individual problem. If you're feeling distress, yeah, there's stuff you can do about this, but it is really we've got to place this into a broader political landscape, that this is a global systemic problem. 
he was also communicating about this and has done again recently about the criminalization of protest that is going on around the world. Protesters around the world increasingly are being silenced. Climate anxiety is one of the only emotional, psychological, mental health difficulties, not a mental illness, that can be pathologized, i.e. you're called mentally ill when you're not. This is a healthy response. Or patronized. You're told to go home, stop worrying about it, go back to school or criminalized. So my objective as a psychologist, psychotherapist, researcher, academic working in this field. So I both do research and have clinical practice working with this is to try and make sure that we can have the right conversations about this and not fall into that simplification of either saying, ah, it's all right or, oh, it's all hopeless. Neither of those positions are going to be helpful. So I'm my job, I think, is to try and make sense of this and communicate about this to different groups. I give these talks quite a lot to say to you, this is how you navigate it. We can't make it go away, but we can learn how to deal with it with emotional intelligence and resilience and community action. You're not on your own with this. Here's some quotes from people where I've got permission from my research and clinical practice to talk about well, what's really going on, because the term climate anxiety doesn't really cover it. Here, somebody said to me, it's not eco anxiety, it's eco terror. We can feel terrified about the scale of what's happening. A young woman in America said to me, she said, I wish I was mad. I said, are you really? You really know what you're wishing for then? She said, yeah. She said, because being mad would be easier than dealing with my climate anxiety. I thought, yeah. You know, some people are going to feel this completely deeply and it'll overwhelm your whole everyday existence. For other people, not so much. I'm going to talk about the different emotional responses in a minute. I'm not judging any of these as right and wrong or better or worse than. What I want everybody listening to do is be feel validated and have the permission to feel this is how I feel about it and not be ashamed or feel you've got to explain yourself to other people. We need to respect the fact we don't all feel the same about this. And they're all relevant. A 19 year old said to me a few years ago, tell me how I should live in a world that doesn't care. I'm going to come to this again repeatedly throughout this talk, but for me, climate anxiety, eco-anxiety would be relatively, and I'm exaggerating again to make a point, relatively quickly resolved if everybody was taking action on the climate and biodiversity crisis. Yes, fear about climate change, the biodiversity crisis is what triggers the anxiety and distress. But really what makes it worse is feeling that you're surrounded by other people who don't care or are not taking it seriously or are not taking collective action as urgently as you might feel you want them to. That is what is even more distressing. This failure to care, this feeling that people don't care equally about this. And it is an unequal problem of injustice around the world. Again, we're going to get more to that in a moment. Paul Hoggett was one of the founders of the Climate Psychology Alliance, and there's two words that he's used here. He says we're living in a time when tragedy, which is without precedent, is unfolding in front of our eyes. We are witnessing catastrophic rates of species extinction, etc. These are key words if we're going to understand this psychologically. We're living in it. It is without precedent. And we are witnessing it all at the same time. So it's not surprising that frequently we don't know how to navigate this. We don't know how to feel because this is new. It is an emergent mental health problem for humanity. Yes, we faced other catastrophes, worldwide problems, world wars, threats. Yeah, we have. But with all of those, 
we were able to psychologically say to ourselves, when we get over this, when we get beyond it, we can go back to normal. We heard that narrative with COVID repeatedly. People rebuild, even during destruction. This is one of the ways that humans keep hope alive. They think about the future. Now, we can do that to some extent with climate change. We must invest in future hopeful projects. However, the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere means we cannot reverse what we've already done. So sea levels will keep rising, heat will keep increasing. And without recognizing that and facing the reality of that, we will never take sufficient action. We will keep living with this futuristic idea of hope and we will not see the reality of what's around us today. Just as fish cannot see the water they're swimming in, if humans cannot adapt and adjust psychologically to see what we're dealing with, we will continue to misrepresent it or use false narratives and fail to take action. I'm sure you're aware of these kind of scaling presentations. I promise you, I am not minimizing COVID. I have long COVID. I'm still dealing with it for pretty much probably three years on. But at scale, the problems of COVID and recession, and COVID probably should be in the biodiversity collapse wave anyway, compared to climate change and biodiversity collapse, there's no comparison. There's no part of the planet that will not be touched by climate and the biodiversity crisis. There is nowhere. And people will, you know, increasingly try to use narratives of, well, we'll, we'll be okay here as a way of reducing their own anxiety. And again, that is false. It Nobody will be okay if everybody is not okay to some extent. It is a planetary problem. And I'm sure you're feeling anxious hearing me say that. And on the one hand, I'm sorry, I don't want to make you feel anxious, but I do want you to feel the anxiety and then know this is what we can do to help with that anxiety. We can't get rid of it. Your anxiety is a healthy response. You just don't want to be overwhelmed by it. Don't set up home in it. Gus Speth is famous for saying he used to think top environment, he's a scientist, he used to think, this is in the United States, he used to think top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. And with 30 years science, we can deal with that. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with those, we need spiritual and cultural transformation. He said scientists don't know how to do that. I think increasingly scientists, This I think he said this about eight, nine years ago, scientists increasingly are very much recognising the need for that integrated approach to this. The University of Bath, where I'm a lecturer, has me teaching this material to chemical engineering students now. We're trying to embed this kind of psychological thinking across the curriculum. If you've not come across her work, Sally Weintraub, and you want to look and dive deeper into this argument about care and a culture of uncare, she links this to neoliberal exceptionalism, roots these difficulties beautifully in multiple political crises and has a book called The Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis online on YouTube. There's some brilliant recordings of her talking about her work with other people when she launched her book. I think it was the year before last. So I just want to signpost some things for you if you want to kind of examine this in more depth in different ways. She very much she acknowledges it's very hard to think about all in one go. It's not easy to explain. Anyone who says it's easy to explain is killing themselves or trying to reduce their own anxiety. She said, and she talks about the culture of uncare driving a kind of group idealization. This is the only way, or this is the best way. And systemically, globally, that's often what's got us into this mess in the first place. I love her language of the fact we need a dream and a nightmare to understand what is wrong 
and then imagine and create a better world. And to do that, we need active hope. I talk about radical hope. She's talking about active hope. It's the same thing. It means acknowledging how bad things are and being able to take action rather than splitting psychologically into a either or narrative. And you can see that being played out with things like the ULES arguments about clean air initiatives in cities. We either have to choose to be on the side of cars or clean air and environmentalism. You can see that psychological splitting. It's absurd, infantile and won't resolve the difficulties. So radical hope, active hope, requires this psychological maturity which holds the tension of these opposite positions and says, OK, and here's the way forwards. And we need strength, we need courage and we need reparation. We need to say sorry to the people around the world who are suffering the worst of this and have not caused this. Humour is a mature defence and humour, I don't want to offend anybody at all, but humour can really help us navigate this and find ways to communicate about this and the difficult, difficult sides of this. She's saying, can you give me a hand moving these from the fiction to the non fiction section 1984 planet of the apes the road the handmaid's tale the hunger games hollywood literature art is excellent films brilliant for finding ways to symbolically think about and communicate and talk about these things that because humanity's never faced anything like this we haven't got the neurological pathways to really know how to navigate this. We can call on our experience from previous disasters. Yeah, but they're not at this scale. So this kind of communication helps us imagine that way forwards that Sally was talking about. I'm using a depth psychology perspective here, and this means I'm including the unconscious. Humans, as far as I'm concerned, are not rational conscious creatures. If we were, there would be no wars, there would be no child abuse. Yes, you can have a political sociological argument about that. We can also have a psychological understanding of the fact that things that we don't want to see and can't tolerate, we push into the unconscious. They bubble back up and they push from underneath. A positivist psychology approach tries to remove the symptoms of distress and anxiety. That's not what I'm advocating here. What I'm advocating here, it's a bit of a cliche. I'm advocating make friends with your distress and your anxiety because they are your best friend here. This is the world which we're inhabiting. We might not like it, but we need to face that reality. And the collective unconscious connects us globally. Why wouldn't I want to feel distress? Because to some extent, without being superior about this, this helps me empathise with how other people are feeling. Again, it connects humanity rather than separates us. I think I've said all of this. But the eco anxiety and distress is a healthy response. If you're feeling this, it's only because you care. You should feel proud that you care. If somebody says, oh, this is eco anxiety, you say, yeah, and I'm proud that I have this, right? We measure mental health by looking at our capacity to connect and be in touch with external reality. So conversely, you could argue if somebody's not got eco anxiety, well, why not? How are they managing to live in this world and not care about what's going on in the world? I'd be very surprised. I don't know how to do that. When we're talking about eco-anxiety as well, we're not just talking about anxiety. We've missed the boat on calling it something better. And people have kind of claimed it as a term, which is fine. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm not going to complain about people talking about emotions. OK, it's a good thing. But it's not just anxiety. It's often also grief, rage, so nostalgia, which is love for the planet and a place, hope and hopelessness. Anger, blame, frustration, guilt and shame. Living in Western Industrial Northern Hemisphere, we have a duty to feel some guilt and shame 
older generations even more so. But do not, we do not need to collapse into that guilt and grief and shame. We need to feel it, own it, take action on it, do something with that. You can transform those painful, difficult feelings into something nourishing that is psychologically a healthy form of expression. It's absolutely okay to have fantasies of rescue and apocalyptic fantasies. It's okay to fantasize that. Don't live in it. Don't make it real. Those are the ways in which our psyche has respite from feeling overwhelmed to fantasize our way through something. Just don't turn it into a reality. Allow it. Don't judge it. Bring yourself back to reality. Our defenses will be there to help us survive things that feel overwhelming. Avoidance, denial, delay, disavow. Again, these are okay in the short term. They're not okay in the long term. Climate denial and delay is now a huge, huge problem in taking action. An even bigger problem is disavow, where somebody says, yeah, climate change is a big problem. We've got to do something. It's really worrying. But Oh, I'm so happy that COVID is over because I didn't get to fly anywhere on holiday for the last three years. I'm taking three flights this year. And you think, well, if you're so worried about climate change, and then how can you also think it's okay to just fly as often as that? So you minimise. You acknowledge the problem, but you also minimise it and push it away. So it leaves people thinking that they're taking action, but they're really not. It's a huge problem. Nihilism, despair. I feel despair sometimes, but I don't set up home in it. Uh, I've been talking about this false binary between apocalyptic thinking and hopeful thinking. What I'm also talking about is the importance of external action, external activism, but also internal. This means dealing with your thinking, dealing with your emotions. I talk about this as an emotional biodiversity. A friend of mine who's an ecologist laughs at me and says, oh, you're not quite really getting that right there. But it's a, again, it's a, I'm trying to find ways when these things are so big and difficult to think about and feel our way through. Ways to be able to relate to this that can help us make sense of this. And this is a model that I've tried to develop because you might be listening to me thinking, well, OK, but depression's not very nice, right? I agree, it's not. Positivist mental health models will try and get rid of the depression. I'm saying some depression, some anxiety in relation to what's going on in the world is a healthy response. But we can go down and feel the depression. Just don't set up home there. Don't stay there. Don't turn that into your only emotional reality but don't stop yourself feeling some of it some of the time either because it's a healthy response but you can move through that through recognizing your own vulnerability the uncertainties that we're facing humanity is really struggling with this yeah have compassion for yourself compassion for others find community and then you can integrate these complex feelings Imagine better futures for yourself. Then it can become empowering. You can create meaning from that journey. Sometimes people say, oh, the cure for eco-anxiety is eco-activism. It kind of irritates me because A, it doesn't need to be cured. It's not a mental illness. And B, if you are just focused on external activism, what you're not doing is doing that downward emotional journey. What that gives you is emotional resilience and the capacity to face life's hardships and adversities, which are not going to go away anytime soon. It's clumsy language, but you can see on the right hand side of this model, you're at a higher level of functioning psychologically than when you went in. This is how we build resilience. And this helps us. It allows you paradoxically, counterintuitively, being able to feel the sadness, the depression, the grief also enables you to feel the joy and to appreciate what we've still got in the world, which is wonderful and meaningful. You need both. 
I touched on the fact that there are age differences around this. This is a British Association of Counseling Psychotherapy survey from 2020, which explores difference in attitude and emotional response by age. And you can see that the younger age group under mid 30s, more concerned, more impacted emotionally. And then it drops in midlife, but then it goes up again towards the later stages of life. Now, I don't know why we can speculate, we can discuss it. Could be that in midlife, you've just got so many things to juggle, taking care of, I mean, you know, simplifying it again, but taking care of aging relatives, children, jobs, paying the bills, marital difficulties, who knows? You could just be a bit overwhelmed, but I think this is significant. Because if you look at the age of, average age of, Politicians and oil company executives, they're in that middle bracket. So I think that is something we need to pay attention to. So we need them to feel this anxiety. If you want a simplified approach to how to cure climate anxiety, I would say the way to reduce climate anxiety in the population is increase climate anxiety in politicians and oil company executives, because if they felt more scared, they would have to act differently. Again, it's a social relational trauma as far as I'm concerned. Again, we do need models to help us try and understand this psychologically without getting over fixated on them because it's emergent, it keeps changing. But one that I think is a bit useful, I have a social work background, is increasingly we're seeing through research that climate change and facing it could be an adverse childhood experience. Now that equates it with having to face war and terrorism. Now we would understand that you would be traumatized by that, of course. Equally, climate change is creating that trauma response, particularly in children and young people globally. We need to understand that because we have a duty of care towards children here. Again, humour. So what do you see in the, here in the seashell? He's saying, I hear the sea level rising. I hear bluefin tuna being hunted. I hear boat people crying. I hear villages being swept away. I want my iPad back. I agree with him. He, we all need times to step away from this and just go, you know what? I need a night off. Do not get caught in just feeling the awfulness of this all the time. It's OK to take a step back and take a break from this, but do it consciously rather than unconsciously just shutting down. So this is the scale that I was talking about earlier. We don't all feel this in the same way, and I'm not judging this as better or worse, but people who have a milder eco-anxiety have transient, movable feelings of upset, and they respond really well to reassurance, being told it's going to be all right. Look, carbon capture will fix this, or let's focus on optimism and hope. But that can get worse, or your hope or your optimism starts to get eroded because people are not taking action, or you're taking as much personal action as you can and feeling it's not enough. A lot of people feel that it's not enough. Individually, we can never save the planet by ourselves. So don't get caught up in that. It is only collective action that is of value. However, individual action can be revolutionary as long as we're all doing it, right? If we all switched to, you know, plant-based milks, for example, tomorrow, it'd be a revolution. It would solve so many things. I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying, as an example, it would change everything. So again, you've got that tension between the individual and the collective action. But as your climate anxiety becomes more severe, you're upset more frequently and you doubt other people's capacity to take action. For me, it's essential to really emphasize this social collective community aspect of climate anxiety, that what makes it worse is other people not feeling similar to the way you feel. As it gets worse and worse and worse, you lose your defences against this. 
you cannot manage your distress as much. You have less and less faith in people's ability to take action at its most severe end. And this is where you really do need up until this point, you don't need professional help to deal with your climate anxiety at all at this most critical end. This is where you absolutely do need professional support to help navigate this. People can feel suicidal. There's a complete loss of ability to feel safe in the world. It's not that people want to die, just that they don't know how to stay safe in the world and cope with these overwhelming complex feelings. I've done quite a lot of work with young people in that area. And the positive message I would give you is that through understanding and support and empathy and navigating a way back towards collective action and personal action, people do recover from this. It's really important to recognise that there's nothing wrong. You're not crazy, but you do need support in that moment. Because what it gets caught up in then is this anticipation of human extinction and social collapse. But what hurts the most is the fact that you feel like nobody cares. That's what's most distressing. And people are increasingly having dreams around this. So you don't even get respite when you're asleep. That's really harsh. That's hard. So I'm going to talk for a few more minutes. I just want to give you a couple of bits of research evidence. This was quantitative research that was done in 2021. 10,000 children and young people in 10 different countries. I could give you a couple of snippets of research to sort of reinforce the numbers side of what I'm talking about. And then a couple more. What can we do? psychologically messages and then I'm going to stop talking. So this was a survey that was done and I want to pick out a few things. So when we're looking at the impact of climate change, we have to look at the impact on daily living, just the physical impact. We have to look at emotional impact, feelings and cognitive impact, the way it leads you to think. A lot of people talk about the emotional not so much the cognitive and I think the cognitive is crucial so let's look at this dark blue line impact on daily living if you're living in India or the Philippines it's 74 percent not surprising these are the countries at the forefront of climate change facing the physical immediacy of this similar with Nigeria similar with Brazil and the UK the US of course Finland, much lower, only 28%, because we're not facing that physical impact much yet. Let's look at the emotional. I'm going to show you some similarities and some differences. For me, as I said, psychoeducational approach. Education is power. If we can understand what's happening, we can learn how to navigate it emotionally. We can be educated around this. Doesn't change everything, but it changes a lot of things. Sad, afraid, 67%. This is the worldwide figure. Anxious, 62%. These are high percentages. Large numbers of young people feeling this way. But let's look at the cognitive. Let's go to, right, here's a different security. Family security will be threatened. High figure worldwide, 52 but only 39% in the UK because we've not got that physical impact here at the moment. So security is not so damaged, but we share the cognitive thinking with other young people around the world in other ways that people have failed to take care of the planet. 83% worldwide, 80% UK. So the young people in the UK think similarly to young people elsewhere in the world. Now, I think this is a positive sign The young people in the UK care, recognise that this is a systemic problem. Of course, worse, Philippines, awful, 92%. Three quarters or more, when we're talking about the mental health impact of this, we do not want large numbers of young people in the world thinking that the future is frightening. This is not OK. 75% worldwide, 73% UK. Right, We are not able to protect 
children and young people in the UK from the cognitive impact of climate anxiety by saying we will be OK here. Not that I think we should because it's unethical and immoral, but it's also not going to work. Over half think humanity is doomed. 56% worldwide, 51% UK. This, this is not OK. The worst statistic is this one. Worldwide and in the UK, 48% of children and young people in that age group told us they were dismissed or ignored by other people when they tried to talk about climate change. That we can change today. That's why I do these talks. That's why I hope you're here. Talk to each other following this. We should never dismiss or ignore or belittle or shame or disallow anyone talking about climate change even if their thoughts and feelings don't match with your own. That's OK. We need range and diversity in this. We're allowed to think and feel differently around this. We should never dismiss anybody's feelings about this. That we need to change. And we linked it to young people's beliefs about governments. This is the UK figures. 65% of these young people thought government was failing young people. Only 28% thought government could be trusted. I have to say, this is 2021, I have to say, if we ran this survey today, I think that figure might be even lower. So yes, there is anger and fear, but there is also reassurance and hope. And I'm going to read you a letter that we got. This is the range of the number of researchers that were involved in this. This is where we're linking the climate crisis and climate anxiety to a human rights issue, failing to act on climate change and climate anxiety and subjecting young people to this is a form of moral injury and could be argued to be cruel, inhuman, degrading and a form of torture. There are multiple legal cases around the world. There's one just being heard, just being considered at the moment in the European Court of Human Rights, where six young people from Portugal are suing I think it's 32 European governments for failing to act on climate change as a contravention of their human rights. So it is psychological, but yes, it's also political. So two minutes and I stop. I've dropped some of this in as we go. Here's our mature defences. How do we feel OK about this? Apart from action in the world, some radical acceptance, not passive. This sucks. It's horrible. Is awful. We should not be in this position, but we are. We need to radically accept that. We need altruism. We need to care about others. We need courage. We need to emotionally self-regulate, which is kind of what I'm talking about the whole time. Gratitude for what we've still got. Humility. We don't have all the answers. Humor, mindfulness, patience, respect. Short-term suppression. Take a night off. Tolerance, self-talk, and put kindness in there as well. Back to the humour. This is my favourite. Your dog is worrying my sheep because the dog is talking to the sheep about global warming, acid rain, floods, drought, etc. I'm sorry if that's not your humour, but that is my humour. I like that. So I've said a lot of this as we've gone. We need to face our denial, come to terms with our irrationality, deal with the emotional side of this, Make a place for emotion in technical solutions. We need those solutions. We need to have a conversation about needs versus wants. You might want to eat meat, fly, blah, 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 blah. But do you need to? And how much do you need to? We need to grieve what we've done and lost and change that and make reparation to the natural world and other countries around the world. That will help us. We need to face these multiple uncertainties and learn to tolerate them. We need the emotional response, the thinking cognitive response and the practical action. We need to always take care of those three areas. That leads towards wisdom. We need the rationality, we need the emotionality, but we need the intersection between them, rational and emotional. And this is where practices like mindfulness can really help. This means creating a tr climate trauma lens. So we're seeing the climate crisis in 
every aspect of life because it permeates everything now. We need to put feelings first, do the internal activism, external activism. I borrowed this from the Professional Association of Diving Instructors, Paddy, I'm a diving instructor as well. And we use this formula when people are panicked underwater, stop, breathe, think, act. Because if you don't, you're gonna be in trouble underwater. And I tweaked that for how do we deal with our anxiety around climate change? And I turned it into feel, think, breathe, understand, act. And then we have a chance to reframe eco-anxiety to eco-understanding, eco-empathy, compassion, courage, community awareness, connection, belonging, meaning, care, eco-aliveness. We might not like it, but we have to accept this as part of what it means to be alive in the world today. And we have to drop this idea of perfection and control. If you've not come across the cartoons of Lunig, I would highly recommend them. The Olympic rings, higher, faster, stronger. And he says, there's another world out there, slower, deeper, wiser. I'm going to give the last words to a young woman who wrote to me when we published this research. I got emails from young people all over the world, which is mind blowing. She said, I'm only a single private person studying in Germany, but I want to thank you for this research. She said, what the study reveals makes me for the first time ever feel I'm not alone with future and climate anxiety. I still don't know where to go to get support. I sent her lots of ideas. We're still corresponding. She said, I consider this recent study as an incredibly important step for young people around the world to imaginary, emotionally connect and visually realise no one of us is alone with this huge issue. I really hope the message of your study reaches politicians around the world, as well as socio-psychological professions, so they can react to the needs of us young people. I think she summarises it perfectly. So, I am going to stop talking. And we have a little bit of time for comments, thoughts, questions, anything. Thanks so much, Caroline. That was um, really interesting. And uh, yeah, I definitely feel motivated to want to redress the, the balance of climate anxiety, give a bit more to those politicians and those people in the middle age bracket for sure. Um, yeah, do if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or pop it in the chat. Um, but yeah, just any, any questions at all uh, are welcome. just as people are maybe thinking or about what they want. Oh, Obe, sorry, you you popping in. Hi. Yes, thank you very much for that excellent uh, presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm able to reconnect from other areas of social sciences to what you have uh, put out mm. there. Uh, in terms of uh, intervention, mm. where would you place this? Uh, regarding um, uh, adaptation mm. and mitigation. That's number one. And then number two, mm. if we were to um, stretch this a little bit, um, do young people that predominantly experience some of the issues that you talked about, mm and also given the inter intergenerational equity embedded mm. in uh, climate change and also agenda 21 of getting everybody involved i wondered if we were to put it to these young children to say your destinies are in your hand mm. would you be able to give up a b c d for this to happen for us to know how they, they react to that. I'm just teasing out some other yeah. little, little thing that can be done from our area. Thank you. Thank and, you. And, and sorry, and just one more thing. Yeah. In the developing countries, one of the, the problems, because uh, uh, I work a lot in Nigeria, mm. one of the, the biggest problems there is that where you find 
a very co strong culture of superstition. Mm. Mm. Where, for example, if it is too hot and the the temperature is over 60 something or whatever, they put it to the gods, bring out animals to slaughter, whatever. Mm. How are they able to relate those physical manifestations of climate change, mm. you know? to um, uh, of environmental degradation to climate change. Mm. Thank you. Wow. Three phenomenal questions. And I wish we had another two or three hours to discuss this. Um, fantastic, thoughtful questions. Thank you. And I apologize in advance for the fact that I'm going to give you short responses, which will feel inadequate. Um, I think I'm going to go for the first one, the intergenerational question, um, which actually I think also connects to the adaptation mitigation one, which is uh, linked to reparation. And I don't know if you ever saw it. If you haven't, I would highly recommend it. Jacinta Adam, who used to be, you know, the Prime Minister, leader of New Zealand, I can't think what she's called, but anyway, you know who she is. She went to the First Nation People's Parliament meeting place house. This was last year, the year before, um, while she was still the Premier of New Zealand, to ask for forgiveness uh, for colonialism and taking First Nation people, Indigenous people's children into schools. Uh, which was basically genocide. Thousands of children were killed. So how do you repair the hurt from something like that? Because of the long-term colonial impact. But ritually, she knew it was very important to do this as part of the step of reparation and to create different relationship, to build a way forwards with the different communities. And she went to them and she said, sorry, it's a sack exercise. And they they put a sack over her head. And I, I su strongly suggest you watch it. It's on YouTube. Because um, people are just breaking down and sobbing with relief at her recognition and her validation of the inequality and the harm and the hurt in order to build new relationships going forwards in the country and i think we need something very similar so i must i'm going to be bringing you the, the more psychological approach here which doesn't mean that there isn't strong social science political economic practical solutions they need to be part of it as well we need to say sorry and we need to both pay reparation to enable countries around the world to make the changes that they need to make but in order to release ourselves from the guilt and the grief and the shame in the same way as i would argue for reparation around slavery it's the same problem and until we achieve that we're not going to create a global understanding and deal with that inequity Saying to young people, this is your destiny is desperately insulting, isn't it? Because we've given them this rubbish. Um, and they quite rightly often feel very angry and frustrated. Um, following a talk that I gave way before COVID in Bath, I was talking about this and a mother and her daughter were listening and they were arguing with each other. And I said as part of the talk, adults need to say sorry. And they emailed me the next day and the mum said, she said, I said sorry to my daughter on the way home for climate change. And the fact she won't have the same choices to fly and uh, as much as I did. And, and her daughter said, well, OK, OK, but what are you going to do about it? And the mum said, well, what do you want me to do? And she said, I want you to come into school and tell them that they have got to allow me to change my extended project to do it on climate change. And I said, OK, I'll do that. And she did. Now, on the one hand, you could say that's a very small achievement. But on the other hand, if we extend that, we should be asking young people, what do you want us to do? 
apart from anything else, I think we should give the vote to 12 year olds. Um, really, we should lower the age of voting politically when it comes to making decisions about any of these things. Um, we can work together. Young people have got inspiration, idealism, creativity, vision, and older generations have got resources. We have to work together. I often give these talks with this uh, ecologist, colleague, friend, Eloise, who's 23, 24. I'm not. And we're different, but we find ways to work together. She was part of the research group. So I'm always trying to make sure that young people's voices are at the centre of all of the research that I do and the clinical presentations that I give. And all of those young people that I quoted, they know I'm quoting them and they are really relieved and pleased that I'm using their experience of this to try and communicate it, about it to others. Again, that's a very small thing, but I'm doing what I can to make reparation and amends. And I think that can make a difference. The superstition thing with Nigeria, I think there has to be a way to deal with this because I think there's just as much superstition elsewhere in the world. We just call it other things. I think we have we we turn oil industries into false gods. And um, I think there are ways to symbolically ritually represent. We, we invest in politicians and oil just as other people invest in gods and goddesses. I think if we actually faced up to that and dropped some of the Western rationality, the Western mindset, and recognised that we are just as bad at uh, trying to use superstition and ritual beliefs to deal with overwhelming anxiety, we're actually no different. There is a group, actually, that uh, which is white folk, that believes that at the point of um, greatest collapse, aliens will descend to the earth and rescue us. Um, I have great affection for this group because A, who knows, maybe, why not? And B, maybe that's no different to the government will save us, technology will save us. Humans invest hope in something outside themselves when they're overwhelmed and terrified. And I don't think, I wouldn't want to classify superstition as being any different to belief in governments. And I think we could actually do something very interesting there together. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, I would love to talk for hours about these things with you. I'd love to hear your thoughts, but we are going to run out of time. Doesn't mean we can't do this again sometime. Absolutely. Is there any more um, questions? I do have one, but I don't want to take someone else's slot if anyone wants to ask one ahead of me. Simon? Hi, hi, Caroline. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've been working on doing some work on climate change, so there's a lot of relevance here. And uh, mm. uh, I remember on one of your slides, uh, it, it built up to act. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm finding uh, w when I look around what actions are available that, that they seem ever so complicated. Mm. There are some simple things. A lot of those, if you like, the bigger ones um, or, or the more substantial ones, um, they just seem very complicated and difficult to achieve. And as a result, and I've, I've spoken with a lot of small individuals can do certain things themselves as well, of course. And I've spoken mm. with a lot of organisations at the smaller end who don't have the manpower to uh, tackle it in the same way that a large organization would and they just don't know where to start I mean have you any experience of that at all yeah absolutely and that goes back to what Sally Weintraub says it's just too big and too difficult and too complex if we try and understand all of it all at once we we disintegrate we fall apart I spend a lot of time every day talking to people about this in therapy and I frequently say you cannot save the planet all by yourself. Stop trying. Trust that collectively you do your bit, you do your bit, you do your bit. We all do our bits. Collectively, 
every tiny little bit makes a difference. But we've all got to be doing those little bits and not. We also at the same time need to hold government and oil companies to account. So we need the personal and the individual, but also the collective and the political. And we need the both at the same time. I asked a group of school children, this was before COVID. Uh, we were sat on, in a park in Bath and uh, I was saying, questioning them as part of my research. I said, what do you want from education? What, what do we need to give you as a generation? They said, right, here's what we need. They said, we don't need lessons on Oxbow Lakes. Sorry, geography teachers. They said, we need lessons in what plants we can eat, how to grow vegetables, how to grow crops, how to do this organically, how to build boats and houses. They want this from education alongside the maths, the English, the languages. Then they said two other things. They said, we need lessons in how to have difficult conversations with our parents. And I loved it because I thought, you're yeah, absolutely right. Back to the relational. And they said, we want lessons in school on how to lobby politicians. And I thought, great. They've got the political, the social, the personal, the practical. They're understanding that we need to do all of that. But we also need the time out, the time off, slow down, sit with the, how it feels. And you're doing, I'd say frequently to people, you're, you think you're doing nothing. The fact that you are breathing through this anxiety and talking with me about it, that counts, right? <laughs> now, we're not going to meditate our way through this crisis, right? But, you know, if you have a dream about it or your friend is upset about it and you tolerate that and sit with them, that counts, that matters. Because the one thing that we could gain from this without putting a positive spin on it is a better world for all of us. We were not doing so well. We had the impact of colonialism, racism, homophobia, epidemic mental health problems in children and young people. What we were doing was not working. The climate crisis gives us an opportunity to rethink this on a systemic global scale. And we should do that. Be, it can bring us back to our think, values. Yeah, I think it'd be good if you gave this talk also to the investment community. I agree. Uh, not yeah. on the basis that they're finance people, but on the basis that they are parents and grandparents. Yeah. Totally. And, I, have, uh, I have given this talk, honestly, to the UN, to Bloomberg, to finance people, to different governments around the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I I just do this two or three times a week for the last five, six years. And I'm just okay. going to carry on. We've got another lot of research emerging, hopefully by the end of this year, which is even bigger, showing that detrimental impact on young people. For me, the combination of the, the business and the finance and insurance and legal and psychological is crucial that intersection have a look at the case at the european court because that claiming that this is a contravention of human rights that could make all the difference right so we have to support those um legal cases from every direction that we possibly can and that's the first case that has claimed that failing to act on climate change has caused climate anxiety in children and that undermines their human rights so you know we need more of that thanks simon great question and um yeah, very good. thank you i'm just aware of time um we, potentially we could squeeze in a, a very quick question if there was one final uh one final question anyone wanted to to raise, but um, yeah, I am conscious that it's a couple of minutes after after two. I'm happy to stay a few minutes. If people need to go, you can go, and otherwise, oh, Bas, yeah. Yes, uh, it's not really a question, but just to thank you very much oh. for uh, coming to give this brilliant lecture. And also to know that um, we'll be looking forward to how we could work together and disseminate that. this wonderful information and see how it fits into most of the things 
uh, we already do here and we are hoping, you know, to do. So thank you very much on behalf of Laura and on behalf of, uh, you know, all of us. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would, yes, please do drop me an email. Um, please do. I'd be very pleased to continue these conversations. That'd be great. Thank you. No, we had a question you said. Yes, yeah, it was just a sort of, yeah, one about the guilt, really. I know that oh, yeah. um, others who I've spoken to have sort of had that feeling of, of guilt. And I just wondered, how can we deal with it where sometimes you feel guilt for things that is not even in your control, which is hard? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have tried to increase cycling so that I'm driving to work less. And I'd like to cycle more places, but there's, it's not always safe with, you know, if I've got my little baby in the trailer and there's no cycle lanes or oh. anything, you know, it's not set up for me to to succeed in that way. And it's just no. feeling guilty no. about that. Totally. Brilliant question. I'm glad we've got to your question. You need to remember Winnicott, Donna Winnicott, the child psychoanalyst, came up with the phrase about good enough parenting. Good enough. He did say mothering, but let's make it parenting because it's fairer. You've just got to try to be good enough around this. And what he means, he doesn't mean be good. What Winnicott meant was you're supposed to fail sometimes. It's OK. You're not supposed to be superhuman. You've got to remember to be human around this. So, you know, eat pizza on the sofa once a week. Don't cycle because you don't feel safe. That's OK. You know, do what you can that is within reason for you. And if you're starting to feel disproportionately guilty, you need to differentiate between healthy guilt and toxic guilt, right? Have you caused the climate crisis all by yourself? No, you haven't. Should you therefore be solving it all by yourself? No, you shouldn't. Are you asking yourself to do what is reasonable and within, you know, what is tolerable and acceptable to you? Yes, you are. Is there any small things, any small differences you could add to that? Probably put those in, say thank you, reward yourself, say well done, I'm proud of me, I'm doing my best and I fell short here and here and here and that's it, I'm human, right? You've got to stay human in this. We have to watch out for that toxic guilt and I think you might be taking on guilt that other people should be feeling more of. You are not ExxonMobil, you are not BP, they should feel really, really bad. You should feel that much bad, right? So make sure your guilt stays in perspective, right? Yeah, and keep in mind that good enough, which means it's okay not to be perfect. Oh my God. That's very helpful to hear. Thank you. Very yeah. reassuring. And if you haven't failed in a particular week, then make sure you fail somewhere because that's humanity, right? Be human about this thank you well that's it's been a, a yeah, wonderful hour and a bit thank you for, for staying on to answer those no, questions fine, and we feel fun. yeah just very privileged to have you when you're talking to all these big important people governments and UN and you've you fitted us into your schedule so yeah no, we really appreciate no, no, it no, don't say that no 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 <laughs> no I no I didn't say that to say oh look at me I no, no I didn't take it like that at all <laughs> um, we know that you are very I don't, for me it's important to talk to everybody because then you'll go and talk to more people and then they those people will talk to more people um and this is a pleasure for me to be honest because I get to meet with like-minded people um and that makes me feel better this is how I deal with my climate distress is feeling part of these communities so it's it's an absolute pleasure well thank you very much and yeah I hope to speak to you again at some point yeah, in the future please. thanks so much caroline bye take care and thanks for joining us everyone thank you bye bye bye